Section 1 of the Vedanta Sutras by Bhadarayana, with a commentary by Shankaracharya, Volume 1, translated by George Thibault. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jeffrey Allen Stumpf. The Vedanta Sutras by Bhadarayana, with a commentary by Shankaracharya, Volume 1, translated by George Thibault. Introduction, Part 1. Introduction. To the sacred literature of the Brahmins, in the strict sense of the term, that is, to the Veda, there belongs a certain number of complementary works without whose assistance the student is, according to Hindu notions, unable to do more than commit the sacred texts to memory. In the first place, all Vedic texts must, in order to be understood, be read together with running commentaries such as Sayana's commentaries on the Samhitas and Brahmanas, and the Bhashyas ascribed to Shankara on the chief Upanishads. But these commentaries do not by themselves conduce to a full comprehension of the contents of the sacred texts, since they confine themselves to explaining the meaning of each detached passage without investigating its relation to other passages, and the whole of which they form part. Considerations of the latter kind are at any rate introduced occasionally only. The task of taking a comprehensive view of the contents of the Vedic writings as a whole, of systematizing what they present in an unsystematical form, of showing the mutual coordination or subordination of single passages and sections, and of reconciling contradictions, which, according to the view of the orthodox commentators, can be apparent only, is allotted to a separate shastra or body of doctrine which is termed mimamsa, that is, the investigation or inquiry, namely, the inquiry into the connected meaning of the sacred texts. Of this mimamsa, two branches have to be distinguished, the so-called earlier purva mimamsa and the latter uttara mimamsa. The former undertakes to systematize the karmakanda, that is, that entire portion of the Veda which is concerned with action, preeminently sacrificial action, and which comprises the samitas and the brahmanas exclusive of the aranyaka portions. The latter performs the same service with regard to the so-called Jnanakanda, that is, that part of the Vedic writings which includes the Oranyaka portions of the Brahmanas, and a number of detached treatises called Upanishads. Its subject is not action but knowledge, namely the knowledge of Brahman. At what period these two Shastras first assumed a definite form we are unable to ascertain. Discussions of the nature of those which constitute the subject matter of the Purva Mimamsa must have arisen at a very early period, and the word Mimamsa itself together with its derivatives is already employed in the Brahmanas to denote the doubts and discussions connected with certain contested points of ritual. The want of a body of definite rules prescribing how to act, that is, how to perform the various sacrifices in full accordance with the teaching of the Veda, was indeed an urgent one, because it was an altogether practical want, continually pressing itself on the advarius engaged in ritualistic duties, and the task of establishing such rules was moreover a comparatively limited and feasible one, for the members of a certain Vedic Sakya, or school, had to do no more than to digest thoroughly their own Brahmana and Samhita without being under any obligation of reconciling with the teaching of their own books the occasionally conflicting rules implied in the texts of other sakyas. It was assumed that action, as being something which depends on the will and choice of man, admits of alternatives, so that a certain sacrifice may be performed in different ways by members of different Vedic schools, or even by the followers of one and the same sakya. The Uttara Mamamsa Shastra may be supposed to have originated considerably later than the Purva Mamamsa. In the first place, the texts with which it is concerned doubtless constitute the latest branch of Vedic literature, and in the second place, the subject matter of those texts did not call for a systematical treatment with equal urgency, as it was in no way connected with practice. The mental attitude of the authors of the Upanishads, 
who in their lucubrations on Brahmin and the soul aim at nothing less than at definiteness and coherence, may have perpetuated itself through many generations without any great inconvenience resulting therefrom. But in the long run two causes must have acted with ever-increasing force to give an impulse to the systematic working up of the teaching of the Upanishads also. The followers of the different Vedic Sakyas no doubt recognized already at an early period the truth that, while conflicting statements regarding the details of a sacrifice can be got over by the assumption of a vikalpa, that is, an optional proceeding, it is not so with regard to such topics as the nature of Brahman, the relation to it of the human soul, the origin of the physical universe, and the like. Concerning them, one opinion only can be the true one, and it therefore becomes absolutely incumbent on those who look on the whole body of the Upanishads as revealed truth to demonstrate that their teaching forms a consistent whole free from all contradictions. In addition, there supervened the external motive that, while the Karmakanda of the Veda concerned only the higher castes of Brahmanically constituted society, on which it enjoined certain sacrificial performances connected with certain rewards, the Jnanakanda, as propounding a certain theory of the world, towards which any reflecting person inside or outside the pale of the orthodox community could not but take up a definite position, must soon have become the object of criticism on the part of those who held different views on religious and philosophic things, and hence stood in need of systematic defense. At present, there exists a vast literature connected with the two branches of the Mimamsa. We have, on the one hand, all those works which constitute the Purva Mimamsa Shastra, or, as it is often shortly but not accurately termed, the Mimamsa Shastra, and on the other hand, all those works which are commonly comprised under the name Vedanta Shastra. At the head of this extensive literature, there stand two collections of sutras, that is, short aphorisms constituting in their totality a complete body of doctrine upon some subject, whose reputed authors are Jainini and Badarayana. There can, however, be no doubt that the composition of these two collections of sutras was preceded by a long series of preparatory literary efforts of which they merely represent the highly condensed outcome. This is rendered probable by the analogy of other shastras, as well as by the exhaustive thoroughness with which the sutras perform their task of systematizing the teaching of the Veda, and is further proved by the frequent references which the sutras make to the views of earlier teachers. If we consider merely the preserved monuments of Indian literature, the sutras, of the two mamamsas as well as of other shastras, mark the beginning. If we, however, take into account what once existed, although it is at present irretrievably lost, we observe that they occupy a strictly central position, summarizing, on the one hand, a series of early literary essays extending over many generations, and forming, on the other hand, the headspring of an ever-broadening activity of commentators as well as virtually independent writers, which reaches down to our days and may yet have some future before itself. The general scope of the two Mimamsa Sutras and their relation to the Veda have been indicated in what precedes. A difference of some importance between the two has, however, to be noted in this connection. The systematization of the Karmakanda of the Veda led to the elaboration of two classes of works, namely the Kalpa Sutras on the one hand and the Purva Mimamsa Sutras on the other hand. The former give nothing but a description as concise as possible of the sacrifices enjoined in the Brahmanas, while the latter discuss and establish the general principles which the author of a Kalpa Sutra has to follow, if he wishes to render his rules strictly conformable to the teaching of the Veda. The Jnanakanda of the Veda, on the other hand, is systematized in a single work, namely the Uttara Mimamsa or Vedanta Sutras which combine the two tasks of concisely stating the teaching of the Veda and of argumentatively establishing the special interpretation of the Veda adopted in the sutras. This difference may be accounted for by two reasons. In the first place, the contents of the Karmakanda, as being of an entirely practical nature, called for summaries such as the Kalpa Sutras, from which all burdensome discussions of method are excluded, 
while there was no similar reason for the separation of the two topics in the case of the purely theoretical science of Brahman. And, in the second place, the Vedanta Sutras throughout presuppose the Purva Mamamsa Sutras, and may therefore dispense with the discussion of general principles and methods already established in the latter. The time at which the two Mimamsa Sutras were composed we are at present unable to fix with any certainty. A few remarks on the subject will, however, be made later on. Their outward form is that common to all the so-called sutras, which aims at condensing a given body of doctrine in a number of concise aphoristic sentences, and often even mere detached words in lieu of sentences. Besides the Mimamsa Sutras, this literary form is common to the fundamental works on the other philosophic systems, on the Vedic sacrifices, on domestic ceremonies, on sacred law, on grammar, and on meters. The two Mamamsa Sutras occupy, however, an altogether exceptional position in point of style. All sutras aim at conciseness. That is clearly the reason to which this whole species of literary composition owes its existence. This their aim they reach by the rigid exclusion of all words which can possibly be spared, by the careful avoidance of all unnecessary repetitions, and, as in the case of the grammatical sutras, by the employment of an arbitrarily coined terminology which substitutes single syllables for entire words or combination of words. At the same time, the manifest intention of the sutra writers is to express themselves with as much clearness as the conciseness affected by them admits of. The aphorisms are indeed often concise to excess, but not otherwise intrinsically obscure. The manifest care of the writers being to retain what is essential in a given phrase and to sacrifice only what can be supplied, although perhaps not without difficulty, and an irksome strain of memory and reflection. Hence the possibility of understanding without a commentary a very considerable portion at any rate of the ordinary sutras. Altogether different is the case of the two Mamamsa sutras. There scarcely one single sutra is intelligible without a commentary. The most essential words are habitually dispensed with. Nothing is, for instance, more common than the simple omission of the subject or predicate of a sentence, and when here and there a sutra occurs whose words construe without anything having to be supplied, the phraseology is so eminently vague and obscure that without the help derived from a commentary, we should be unable to make out to what subject the sutra refers. When undertaking to translate either of the Mamamsa sutras, we therefore depend altogether on commentaries, and hence the question arises which of the numerous commentaries extant is to be accepted as a guide to their right understanding. The commentary here selected for translation, together with Badarayana's sutras, to which we shall henceforth confine our attention to the exclusion of Jaimini's Purva Mamamsa sutras, is the one composed by the celebrated theologian Shankara, or as he is commonly called, Shankaracharya. There are obvious reasons for this selection. In the first place, the Shankara Bhashya represents the so-called orthodox side of Brahminical theology, which strictly upholds the Brahmin or highest self of the Upanishads as something different from, and in fact immensely superior to, the divine beings such as Vishnu or Shiva, which, for many centuries, have been the chief objects of popular worship in India. In the second place, the doctrine advocated by Shankara is, from a purely philosophical point of view and apart from all theological considerations, the most important and interesting one which has arisen on Indian soil. Neither those forms of the Vedanta which diverge from the view represented by Shankara, nor any of the non-Vedantic systems can be compared with the so-called orthodox Vedanta in boldness, depth, and subtlety of speculation. In the third place, Shankara's Bhashya is, as far as we know, the oldest of the extant commentaries, and relative antiquity is at any rate one of the circumstances which have to be taken into account, although it must be admitted too much weight may easily be attached to it. The Shankara Bhashya further is the authority most generally deferred to in India as to the right understanding of the Vedanta Sutras, and ever since Shankara's time, the majority of the best thinkers of India have been men belonging to his school. If, in addition to all this, we take into consideration the intrinsic merits of Shankara's work which, 
as a piece of philosophical argumentation and theological apologetics, undoubtedly occupies a high rank, the preference here given to it will be easily understood. But to the European, or generally modern, translator of the Vedanta Sutras with Shankara's commentary, another question will of course suggest itself at once, namely whether or not Shankara's explanations faithfully render the intended meaning of the author of the sutras. To the Indian Pandit of Shankara's school, this question has become an indifferent one, or, to state the case more accurately, he objects to it being raised, as he looks on Shankara's authority as standing above doubt and dispute. When pressed to make good his position, he will, moreover, most probably not enter into any detailed comparison of Shankara's comments with the text of Badarayana's sutras, but will rather endeavor to show on speculative grounds that Shankara's philosophical view is the only true one, whence it of course follows that it accurately represents the meaning of Badarayana, who himself must necessarily be assured to have taught the true doctrine. But on the modern investigator, who neither can consider himself bound by the authority of a name however great, nor is likely to look to any Indian system of thought for the satisfaction of his speculative wants, it is clearly incumbent not to acquiesce from the outset in the interpretations given of the Vedanta Sutras and the Upanishads by Shankara and his school, but to submit them, as far as that can be done, to a critical investigation. This is a task which would have to be undertaken even if Shankara's views as to the true meaning of the sutras and Upanishads had never been called into doubt on Indian soil, although in that case it could perhaps hardly be entered upon with much hope of success, but it becomes much more urgent, and at the same time more feasible, when we meet in India itself with systems claiming to be Vedantic and based on interpretations of the sutras and Upanishads more or less differing from those of Shankara. The claims of those systems to be in the possession of the right understanding of the fundamental authorities of the Vedanta must at any rate be examined, even if we should finally be compelled to reject them. It appears that already, at a very early period, the Vedanta Sutras had come to be looked upon as an authoritative work, not to be neglected by any who wished to affiliate their own doctrines to the Veda. At present, at any rate, there are very few Hindu sects not interested in showing that their distinctive tenets are countenanced by Badarayana's teaching. Owing to this, the commentaries on the sutras have in the course of time become very numerous, and it is at present impossible to give a full and accurate enumeration even of those actually existing, much less of those referred to and quoted. Mr. Fitz Edward Hall, in his Bibliographical Index, mentions 14 commentaries, copies of which had been inspected by himself. Some among these, as for instance Ramanuja's Vedanta Sara, number 35, are indeed not commentaries in the strict sense of the word, but rather systematic expositions of the doctrines supposed to be propounded in the sutras. But, on the other hand, there are in existence several true commentaries which had not been accessible to Fitz Edward Hall. It would hardly be practical, and certainly not feasible in this place, to submit all the existing bhashyas to a critical inquiry at once. All we can do here is to single out one or a few of the more important ones, and to compare their interpretations with those given by Shankara and with the text of the sutras themselves. The bhashya, which in this connection is the first to press itself upon our attention, is the one composed by the famous Vaishnava theologian and philosopher Ramanuja, who is supposed to have lived in the 12th century. The Ramanuja, or, as it is often called, the Sri Bhashya, appears to be the oldest commentary extant next to Shankara's. It is further to be noted that the sect of the Ramanujas occupies a preeminent position among the Vaishnava, sects which themselves, in their totality, may claim to be considered the most important among all Hindu sects. The intrinsic value of the Sri Bhashya, moreover, is, as every student acquainted with it will be ready to acknowledge, a very high one. It strikes one throughout as a very solid performance due to a writer of extensive learning and great power of argumentation, and in its polemic parts directed chiefly against the school of Shankara. It not unfrequently deserves to be called brilliant even. And in addition to all this, it shows evident traces of being not the mere outcome of Ramanuja's individual views, but
but of resting on an old and weighty tradition. This latter point is clearly of the greatest importance. If it could be demonstrated or even rendered probable only that the oldest bhashya which we possess, that is, the Shankara bhashya, represents an uninterrupted and uniform tradition bridging over the interval between Bharadayana, the reputed author of the sutras, and Shankara, and if, on the other hand, it could be shown that the more modern bhashyas are not supported by old tradition, but are nothing more than bold attempts of clever sectarians to force an old work of generally recognized authority into the service of their individual tenets, there would certainly be no reason for us to raise the question whether the later bhashyas can help us in making out the true meaning of the sutras. All we should have to do in that case would be to accept Shankara's interpretations as they stand, or at the utmost, to attempt to make out, if at all possible, by a careful comparison of Shankara's bhashya with the text of the sutras, whether the former in all cases faithfully represents the purport of the latter. In the most recent book of note, which at all enters into the question as to how far we have to accept Shankara as a guide to the right understanding of the sutras, Mr. A. Goff's Philosophy of the Upanishads, the view is maintained that Shankara is the generally recognized expositor of true Vedanta doctrine, that that doctrine was handed down by an unbroken series of teachers intervening between him and the Sutrakara, and that there existed from the beginning only one Vedanta doctrine, agreeing in all essential points with the doctrine known to us from Shankara's writings. Mr. Goff undertakes to prove this view, firstly, by a comparison of Shankara's system with the teaching of the Upanishads themselves, and, secondly, by a comparison of the purport of the sutras, as far as that can be made out independently of the commentaries, with the interpretations given of them by Shankara. To both these points we shall revert later on. Meanwhile, I only wish to remark concerning the former point that, even if we could show with certainty that all the Upanishads propound one and the same doctrine, there yet remains the undeniable fact of our being confronted by a considerable number of essentially differing theories, all of which claim to be founded on the Upanishads. And with regard to the latter point, I have to say for the present that, as long as we have only Shankara's Bhashya before us, we are naturally inclined to find in the sutras, which, taken by themselves, are for the greater part unintelligible, the meaning which Shankara ascribes to them. While a reference to other Bhashyas may not impossibly change our views at once. Meanwhile, we will consider the question as to the unbroken uniformity of Vedantic tradition from another point of view, namely, by inquiring whether or not the sutras themselves and the Shankara Bhashya furnish any indications of their having existed already at an early time essentially different Vedantic systems or lines of Vedantic speculation. Beginning with the sutras, we find that they supply ample evidence to the effect that already at a very early time, namely the period antecedent to the final composition of the Vedanta Sutras in their present shape, there had arisen among the chief doctors of the Vedanta differences of opinion, bearing not only upon minor points of doctrine, but affecting the most essential parts of the system. In addition to Badarayana himself, the reputed author of the Sutras, the latter quote opinions ascribed to the following teachers, Atreya, Asmaratya, Audolomi, Karshnagini, Kasakritsna, Jaimini, Badari. Among the passages where diverging views of those teachers are recorded and contrasted, three are of particular importance. Firstly, a passage in the fourth pada of the fourth Adhyaya, Sutras 5-7, through seven, where the opinions of various teachers concerning the characteristics of the released soul are given, and where the important discrepancy is noted that, according to Adalomi, its only characteristic is thought, Kaitanya, while Jaimini maintains that it possesses a number of exalted qualities, and Badarayana declares himself in favor of a combination of those two views. The second passage occurs in the third pada of the fourth Adhyaya, Sutras 7-14, through 14, where Jaimini maintains that the soul of him who possesses the lower knowledge of Brahman goes after death to the highest Brahman, while Badari, whose opinion is endorsed by Shankara, teaches that it repairs to the lower Brahman only. Finally, the third and most important passage is met with in the fourth pada of the first Adhyaya, Sutras 20-22, through 22, 
where the question is discussed why in a certain passage of the Bradaranyaka, Brahman is referred to in terms which are strictly applicable to the individual soul only. In connection therewith, the sutras quote the views of three ancient teachers about the relationship in which the individual soul stands to Brahman. According to Asmaratya, if we accept the interpretation of his view given by Shankara and Shankara's commentators, the soul stands to Brahman in the Beda Beda relation. That is, it is neither absolutely different nor absolutely non-different from it, as sparks are from fire. Aodalomi, on the other hand, teaches that the soul is altogether different from Brahman up to the time when obtaining final release it is merged in it, and Kasakritsna finally upholds the doctrine that the soul is absolutely non-different from Brahman, which in some way or other presents itself as the individual soul. That the ancient teachers, the ripest outcome of whose speculations and discussions is embodied in the Vedanta Sutras, disagreed among themselves on points of vital importance is sufficiently proved by the three passages quoted. The one quoted last is specially significant as showing that recognized authorities, deemed worthy of being quoted in the sutras, denied that doctrine on which the whole system of Shankara hinges, namely, the doctrine of the absolute identity of the individual soul with Brahman. End of section 1